Hi, I'm Alexei. This is the second episode of IB Theory of Knowledge Explained. You know, this year I have marked around 300 TOK essays, and this experience has been both enlightening in some ways and very irritating in some other ways. The most irritating aspects of this essay reading experience is that you get exposed to the same kinds of arguments and the same examples migrating from one essay to another. And it's literally like you're reading the same stuff dozens and even hundreds of times, and you end up giving the same feedback. But even more irritating than that is how simplistic some of these common arguments are. For example, it appears to be very common among students to say things like natural sciences are objective as opposed to other areas of knowledge that are more subjective, such as human sciences or history. What rubbish, it's such an oversimplification. It, it's not a totally wrong thing to say, but every time someone says it, I know immediately that this someone doesn't really understand or has a very superficial understanding of how science works. In this video, I will explain why it is such a gross oversimplification to say that natural sciences are objective. I will suggest a couple of ideas that you could talk about instead to make your argument deeper and more meaningful and to make more sense. That's the structure of the video that I will follow. But before we begin, I need to advertise my awesome book, the TOK textbook for the new syllabus. We have structured the book in a way that it's broken down into key concepts. So it pretty much is a collection of a hundred lessons, each of which teaches you one key TOK concept. A hundred lessons, a hundred concepts. These concepts then become the building blocks that you can use to construct complex, meaningful arguments in theory of knowledge, arguments that actually make sense. There's a lesson on underdetermination of scientific theories in the book, and there's another one on theory-laden facts the two things that I will touch upon in this video. A whole series of lessons revolves around the concepts of subjectivity and objectivity, showing that these concepts are not actually as simple as many people seem to think. Anyway, check the book out. So the reason people are claiming that natural sciences are objective is because the purpose of science is to understand the material world, you know, the universe that exists, whether or not we humans are in it that will exist long after we're gone, that existed long before we came. To understand how this universe works, researchers must remove themselves as much as possible from their study. They must do everything they can to avoid any sort of bias of measurement or any sort of distorted observations. For that purpose, they use the so-called scientific method, which has been designed to provide a guarantee that everything in our power has been done to eliminate bias as much as possible. Falsifiability is a crucial component of the scientific method. If you don't know what falsifiability is, watch our first episode. This does indeed mean that natural sciences are very good at safeguarding against uh, things like personal biases and errors of measurement and preferences of researchers, occasional mistakes or beliefs that don't fit the available evidence and so on. However, it does not necessarily mean that natural sciences or our scientific beliefs reflect reality as it is. We're doing all that we can possibly do in order to avoid incorrect beliefs and biased assumptions, but it does not mean that we are successful. So why not? Well, I will give you several reasons. Reason number one is underdetermination of scientific theories by evidence. We have a bunch of available data, our evidence about the world, right? It comes from our multiple observations and experiments. For example, you know the Big Bang Theory. It's a theory that claims that the whole universe used to be packed inside a tiny, infinitely dense particle known as the singularity. And that 13.8 billion years ago, this particle sort of exploded, sending all matter flying apart. It's a widely accepted scientific theory of the origin of the universe, so much so that many people simplistically assume that the Big Bang theory is an objective theory. However, obviously we didn't observe the Big Bang directly. We couldn't because we didn't exist. In fact, 
nothing existed, not even the concept of an observer. So how do we know about the Big Bang? Well, we have some pieces of observational evidence that we can observe here and now, and that need to be explained by whatever theory we propose. One such crucial piece of evidence is the red shift. The red shift is when a source of light moves away from us, and so it appears to us closer to the red side of the color spectrum. So if a star moves away from us, its color will appear to be closer to the red side. And the faster it moves away, the redder it is. Because light is a wave, and as the source of light is moving away from us, the, the length of the wave kind of stretches. The opposite, when the source of light is moving towards us, and the wave is kind of squashed, it's called the blue shift. The crucial observation here is that in our universe, stars that are more distant from us emit light that is closer to the red side of the spectrum. In other words, faraway stars appear more red. This suggests that the universe is expanding. How could that happen? A big explosion in the past would be a theory that is consistent with this observation. Something exploded and this explosion sent stuff flying apart. And it still is. Another crucial piece of evidence upon which the Big Bang theory rests is the cosmic background microwave radiation. This is a uniformly distributed radiation that is coming from all directions. Whichever way you point the registering antenna, it will be there and its characteristics will be exactly the same. It's a faint glow of light, thermal energy coming from all parts of the sky. It was discovered in 1964. This radiation is thought to be the echo of the Big Bang. So we have evidence to support the Big Bang theory, right? Which means that the theory is objective. Right, but not quite. The problem is the Big Bang theory is not the only theory that is consistent with our evidence. In fact, there exist dozens of others. For example, one of them was proposed by Christoph Wetterich, a theoretical physicist from Germany. He developed a theory that suggested that there was no Big Bang, that the universe originated not in a hot, dense state, but in a long, cold slog, that the universe had no beginning and that time stretched infinitely into the past. However, with the course of time, every single particle in the universe, according to the theory, is becoming heavier. Yes, it's a very strange assumption. But come on, the assumption that it all began with an infinitely dense and an infinitely small particle that decided to explode billions of years ago for no apparent reason is also quite strange. However, if you assume that particle masses are constantly increasing, then you can explain both the redshift and the background radiation without the need for a big explosion. Both these phenomena would appear in a universe where everything is becoming heavier. So the model is consistent with our available data. What's interesting, both this model and the Big Bang theory, as well as a couple of other alternative theories of the origins of the universe, are equally consistent with the available data, with all known observations. So how do we decide which one to choose? Sometimes in science, we choose the one theory over the others because it is slightly more consistent with the data that we currently have. But sometimes data is not enough to make a choice. And then we choose for some other reasons. For example, how comfortable scientists feel with a particular theory, or even simply because one theory gained more popularity than the other. Scientific theories are not objective, no. They are simply one of the available explanations that we accept because it seems to us at a given point of time that it is better than all other explanations even if these other explanations fit into all available data equally well. Observational evidence will never be exhausted. For example, we will never be able to go 13.8 billion years back in time and see what actually happened. And so there will always be multiple or at least several explanations equally consistent with the incomplete data that we have. Theory is always underdetermined by evidence and the determination of theory by evidence. These explanations will differ in terms of the assumptions they make, and we will accept those of them whose assumptions to us seem more plausible or less ridiculous. 
saying that science provides the least ridiculous of the currently available explanations is not quite the same as saying science is objective. Reason number two for why we can't say that scientific theories are objective is theory-laden facts. It is very common for people to say, oh, natural sciences are objective because they're based on evidence or supported by observation, that there are observational facts. And if a theory does not fit the observational facts, the theory gets rejected. That's kind of true, but also it rests upon the assumption that observational facts themselves are not dependent on theory. So the assumption is that we can observe something or register something in an experiment. And this fact that we registered will be objective in the sense that it does not depend on which theory the observer accepts. That whoever is looking at an apple falling from a tree, be it Aristotle, Newton, or Einstein, they will register the same thing. Well, this is wrong. There's a problem known as the problem of theory-laden facts. It means just that, that all facts are theory-laden. In other words, any observational fact already contains an element of theory in it, and that it's impossible to obtain pure observational facts independent from theory. But if that is true, then how can we use observational facts to test a theory if facts themselves are dependent on theory? It's, like, it's a bit like having all your IB exams marked by one of your relatives and then claiming that your marks are objective. Let me give you some examples. My first example is gravitational lensing. So this is an image obtained from the Hubble Space Telescope. The small blurs are all distant galaxies. How cool is that, by the way? This tiny blur that we observe through the telescope is actually an enormous collection of stars and solar systems. So the orange ones are closer to us than the white ones. I have a simple question. How many galaxies do you see in this picture? You're probably thinking, well, I see three orange blurs and one, two, three, four, five, probably six white blurs. So there are nine galaxies here in this picture. You might be surprised to know that the picture shows four galaxies. Three galaxies that are 7 billion light years away. These are the orange blurs. And only one galaxy behind them, that is 11 billion light years away, the white blurs. So why do you see not one, but six white blurs? This is because, as demonstrated in Einstein's relativity theory, light bends when it passes close to large masses. When light from that one distant galaxy reaches the three orange galaxies, their gravitational pull bends it. And as a result, we see what we see. It's called gravitational lensing. And you can see in this picture here how it works. Isn't that weird? If we're not equipped with Einstein's theory, if we don't know what gravitational lensing is, and if we don't take it into account, then this picture is observational evidence for us that there are six distant galaxies over there. But if we equip ourselves with the theory, which we do, this is evidence of one distant galaxy. When you filter your perception through theory and some mathematical calculations, you get to know the reality hidden behind the appearance. All you see through your telescope are dots and blurs, but how do you know what they are? How do you turn dots and blurs into an observational fact expressed in language? You filter these observations through a very complex system of theories and mathematical equations. Just pointing my telescope at the night sky for hours will not bring me closer to knowing the universe. My brain and all of the knowledge that it contains is also part of my telescope and it determines what I will see. So do you see why we cannot simply say that science is objective because it's based on observations? All observations need to be interpreted and we interpret them on the basis of a theory or our prior knowledge. So any observational fact already bears the influence of this theory. Facts are theory laden and theories may be wrong. Hence, facts may be wrong. I'll give you another example. It's known as Paul Feyerabend's tower argument. Feyerabend is a 20th century philosopher of science. And among other things, he rejected the idea that observational facts can be used as true tests for theories. When in the 15th century, Copernicus suggested that the Earth is not stationary and is in fact moving, 
many considered that idea crazy. Some people said, if the earth is moving, how come we don't feel it? Some people couldn't accept the idea for re religious reasons because it implied that the earth, God's top creation, is not in the center of everything. But one scientific argument against Copernicus was the tower argument. If you climb a tall tower and drop a stone from it, it falls directly beneath you. This is an observable fact. But if the earth was moving, then it would have moved as the stone was falling, so the stone would not have landed vertically. It would have landed at some distance from the tower, the distance equivalent to the distance the earth travels while the stone is falling. This is not what we observe, however. The stone falls directly beneath the tower, hence the earth is stationary. You see, today we know a lot, and we know that at the time when the stone is released from the scientist's hand, it does not stop moving horizontally. In fact, as it is falling down, it continues moving horizontally together with the earth. But this notion of inertial motion, motion that continues after the force that was applied to an object, no longer acts upon it. This notion was only introduced in the 17th century by Isaac Newton. At the time of Copernicus, the concept of inertial motion did not exist. And the widespread scientific belief was that an object can only continue to move if a continuous force is being applied to it. As soon as the force stops, so does motion. When a stone is falling down from the tower, no force is acting upon it that would be moving it horizontally. Therefore, it cannot move horizontally as it is falling. Scientists of that time didn't even question it because these assumptions were part of their well-established scientific picture of the world. They simply observed that the earth is not moving beneath the stone as the stalling is falling from the tower. It was their observational fact. In a way, when scientists of that time rejected Copernican ideas of a moving earth, they were right, or at least they were justified in doing so. From their viewpoint, Copernican ideas were not consistent with observational scientific evidence. They, con they conducted an observation and the theory did not fit the observational data. Therefore, they rejected the theory. What they did not realize at that time was that the observational evidence itself was based on a theory and that it was an incorrect theory. This is why you can't simply say that scientific theories are objective because they're based on observational data. Scientific theories are based on observational data, which itself is based on scientific theories. So it's not as simple as it seems. Curiously, when the idea of inertial motion made its way into science, it was accepted that the stone, while falling, is also moving horizontally together with the Earth. With this in mind, Copernican views no longer contradicted the observation. But note that Copernican theory itself didn't change. It was the observation or the fact that changed. The takeaway message here is that if a theory is inconsistent with facts, it is not necessarily false. Facts themselves may be false if they're based on a false theory, because all facts are theory laden. So let's go back to where we started and summarize why you can't say that natural sciences are objective. It depends on what you mean by objectivity, and I will probably make a separate episode about that. But suppose we define objective knowledge as knowledge that corresponds to the objectively existing reality. So there's reality and there's us, and we observe reality. Reality is objective in the sense that it does not care if we're observing it or not. It, it, it just is, and it will remain after we're all extinct. It will not even notice that we're gone. And then there's our objective knowledge of the objective reality. Our knowledge is objective if it corresponds to the actual reality of things. So natural sciences give us knowledge of this objectively existing reality. And the question is, can we say that this scientific knowledge is itself objective? The problem here is we don't know for sure. If only we could have direct access to reality, then we could say, OK, this is reality and this is our knowledge of reality. Do they match? Yes, they do. Hooray, our knowledge is objective. But unfortunately, we don't have direct access to reality. We can't see it as it is. All we have is our knowledge. The only way you can see reality as it is, is if you are God. And if you're not God, then you can only perceive reality through the limited apparatus of your head. So natural sciences can get as close as possible to God's view of the world 
to step out of our heads and get a glimpse of the universe as it actually is, science does a great job. We have designed a rigorous method, the scientific method, to test our beliefs and make sure that they have a real basis and not just a figment of our imagination. History of science has been a history of disillusionment. We rigorously tested our incorrect intuitive beliefs and abandoned them, replacing them with the scientific picture of the world. But even so, science is still a product of our heads. It is a mental picture that we constructed about the world. It is not the real world itself. We have all reasons to believe beyond a reasonable doubt that there is a direct correspondence between this mental picture and the real world. But the whole purpose of science is to keep continuously doubting and testing this belief. Theories turn out incorrect, even if they seem to be based on facts. It's a normal process. If we claim something categorical, such as science is objective, we're defeating the whole purpose of science and we're ruining its spirit to be skeptical, to doubt, to, to never jump to unjustified conclusions. Once again, check out the book if you want more clarity on what theory of knowledge is and how it works. If you have any suggestions on what can be covered in the next episodes, let me know. See you next time.